Let us pray. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits that you may enter our God, our Christ, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, are there words to speak into this moment? Here we go again, Riverside. We're in the newspapers for no good reason at all. It isn't about Freedom School or the food pantry, barber training or coming home. The pretty amazing border wall installation on the scaffolding along Riverside Drive. And if you haven't seen that yet, go and see it. It's about us tearing each other apart. It reflects wounds that defy healing, deeply destructive habits of being that arise from unmet needs, opportunistic, misdirected anger given oxygen and newsprint. Who can really say? Every new story, every new angle of perspective, every new revelation, every move and counter move adds layer upon layer of irreconcilable content, narrative lore that becomes a part of our history, the story of who we are as a people of God. I'M NOT SURE WHY THE NEWSPAPERS DON'T REALIZE THEY ARE BEING USED, MANIPULATED BY MOSTLY UNNAMED PEOPLE WHOSE MOTIVES ARE AS HIDDEN AS THEY ARE. BUT WE HAVE NO BLAME TO DIRECT TO REPORTERS DOING THEIR WORK. We are rightly distressed at how easy we make that work for them by the indiscriminate sharing of confidential documents that belong in file drawers in the Human Resources Office in the Tower of the Church because they are personnel matters about people we love who are a part of our community. They are not secrets, they are confidential, personal matters. They don't belong spread upon the pages of the Times, the Post, and on and on as the days follow one another and pain, confusion, and conflict spread and deepen. Kevin Van Hook preached at Space for Grace last Wednesday about chaos or community. It's a choice. On Monday, July 1st, Amy Butler and Marilyn Mitchell signed a message that fully represented each word what Amy and the church council wanted to say about her departure. After five years of leadership, Pastor Amy will not be renewing her contract as senior minister. As Pastor Amy's contract has approached its end, both she and our congregational leadership have been prayerfully discerning how best to fulfill the work of God in the world to which they are called. Can she, can Amy, and they not be trusted to mean what they say and to say only what in their wisdom they deem necessary? 
others, and the numbers just keep growing, think not. So here we are today, four, five, six, eight newspaper articles later, surely an insufficient number, countless shares, posts, pictures, comments on every social media platform available, private matters cast upon the cyber universe. Shame on us. On us all. Our task since June 30 was to begin to understand how to be a community of people of God in the wake of Pastor Amy's departure. Already hard work, now made enormously more difficult. We can do this work. We must. We just have to answer one question. Then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. How do I get to heaven? Not by fulfilling the law, Jesus told him. It's altogether deeper than that. There is no foolproof legal path here, Jesus was saying to him. No highway to heaven paved by corporation law or bylaws. Laws are tools at once liberating and confining. They are as apt to produce justice as they are oppression. Laws at one time or another, some written, some unwritten, made it illegal to marry freely, to buy a house in a certain neighborhood, to drink from a public water fountain, to terminate a pregnancy, to vote if you were a woman or a man who didn't own property. In ancient Israel, you couldn't charge interest on loans. Oh, Lord, bring that one back. After a nocturnal emission, a man had to leave the camp until after sunset and a good cleaning. A stubborn and rebellious son who also drank too much stoned him to death. Couldn't wear clothes made of wool and linen together or plow with an ox and a donkey at the same time. There are still places today with laws that say you can't be homosexual. Now, that's absurd to begin with. You can't be gay. That's like passing a law that says you can't be white. Or in effect, you're only three-fifths human. Absurd. Laws create poverty make and keep people poor, shield and benefit great wealth, destroy our planet, deliberately allowing the poisoning of water and air and earth to enhance profit. No, Jesus told him, fidelity to the law won't get you into heaven. Even if you could only concentrate on the good laws. Getting to good is about much more than fulfilling the law. How do I get to heaven? What must I do to eternal, inherit eternal life? That isn't the question at all. Who is my neighbor? 
That's the question. That's the question humankind has had great difficulty answering in every century as the sweep of history moves from war to wall to war. That's the question we have difficulty answering in every encounter as one day becomes the next and mercy is sacrificed for bite-sized victories. Let's admit almost every day most of us are not the Good Samaritan. If you can't, if you don't pass by one, two, ten strangers lying on the ground, sitting on the sidewalk, begging on the subway, standing dazed and half naked, you won't ever get to work or to the museum or to meet a friend for lunch. There is no way home, not in New York City, that does not cross paths with misery, with, as in our text, the half-dead. We must attend to neighbors today through altogether more systemic means, though we must always see the constant stranger in need as neighbor and do what we can when we can. But today, here at Riverside, the question has deep meaning. Who is my neighbor? Amy Butler? The church council? Those who leak to the press? Those who agree with my position with a particular solution to the problem at hand. Those who demand to know more, to know all. Those who struggle to accept what seems completed, sad and disillusioning as it necessarily is. Those who seem relieved and look forward to whatever comes next. Who is my neighbor? That's our question. All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. The ones who show mercy. The psalmist, Psalm 82, you heard it read, poetic imagination on full display sees the God of Israel rising to speak in the divine council that ruled the world. And this being the Hebrew Bible, God condemns these pretenders for judging unjustly and favoring, showing partiality, granting favors to the wicked the folks already far above and ahead in life, those sitting at the top of the pyramid, the privileged, the unholy wealthy, the legacies, the boys, and private clubs. Give justice to the weak and vulnerable. Protect the rights of the made poor. Save people from being used up by evil, the poet says, and then this startling line, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. It has to be understood in poetic light 
and ancient views of the order of things, but it floored me when I read it. And as July 27th draws near, it will mark not only Nancy and my 45th wedding anniversary, but the 44th anniversary of my ordination. Next year, if I'm still here, I'll invite you all to a celebration of my 45th. I've never marked this anniversary in any way, except perhaps in my own mind and heart. But the line, you are gods, made me think of something Edler Hawkins preached at my ordination all those years ago. This ministry, Mike, and to which you enter formally today, carries with it certain high responsibilities. And it may be that this is the point at which you draw back, and rightly so, and feel that you cannot attain unto it. I'm thinking of that occasion when the Lord summoned Moses and despite his refusal said to him, Thou shalt be unto them as God. Terribly confusing as that may be to say to you, there is a sense in which this is something of the testing and demand that will be made upon your life. You cannot be to people as God, and you know that, but you shall certainly be the channel through which the Spirit of a living God will speak to people. It may be that the only revelation they may have of God will be through you and at your hands. I, I carry that mantle with me since then. But friends, you know that's just not about me. It's about all of us who claim this body, Jesus crucified and risen, we are mediating the revelation of God to all those who come through those doors and sit among us, all those who read about us in the newspaper. Surely, as we go on, this message must change. And the words of the writer of Colossians, God has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of God's beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We've been rescued and transferred into beloved community, bought and paid for by the one in whose name we gather. The world is watching us right now, reading about us, texting and tweeting and praying, some of them, for us. I can neither count nor respond to all the offers of prayer and support that I have received from friends and colleagues in ministry over all my years, and I trust you are being supported, and we are supporting one another as we endure this moment. We are the channel through which the Spirit of a living God will speak. We've got days and months to go in this. Let's say something powerful. 
let's say, something transformative. Let's say something beautiful. It's a choice. Amen.